everybody, welcome back to day eight of our EKG challenge. And today we're going to be diving into bundle branch blocks, specifically the left bundle branch block. And so what we're gonna talk about is really the fundamental aspects of how can we get a wide or evaluate a wide QRS complex in the setting of a sinus rhythm. So let's take a look at this EKG and a little bit, learn a little bit about bundle branch blocks. First, the concept I want to um, kind of bring to your attention with a bundle branch block is we look for bundle branch blocks when the QRS is wide, but when the sinus node, when the sinus node is driving the rhythm. So what does that mean? We know that when the sinus node beats, here's my sinus node here in blue, when my sinus node fires off, it drives our rhythm. It's the pacemaker node of the cell, and that generates our P wave. We then know that when that sinus P wave gets transmitted via the AV node down to the ventricles. It does so via this his per Kinji system, right? And that is a rapidly conducting system. That's our his bundle in our Purkinje fibers. And that rapidly conducting system allows for a narrow complex QRS. It allows for our QRS to be narrow. Because remember that narrow means fast. So the his bundles, the right and left bundles, they're all contributing to this narrow, rapidly conducting QRS complex. We like that because we want our ventricles to squeeze at the same time, um, good synergistic squeeze. Now, in a bundle branch block, this is a phenomenon that occurs when there is disease within the bundle branches. The bundle branches, just to review a little bit of anatomy here, so you have your bundle of his, and then it branches. It branches into the right bundle, and it branches into the left bundle. And those bundles supply the left and right sides of the heart with the electrical fibers or uh, signals that are coming down. And so essentially in a bundle branch block, there is a disease of one of these bundle branches. You can have a left bundle branch block. You can have a right bundle branch block. And so as you can imagine what would happen in say a left bundle branch block, so let's Let's just, here's our left bundle, here's the right bundle. So imagine what happens when we block the left bundle. What that means is that that conducting fiber, the left bundle, is diseased and it's, the signal can't get through. So the signal, when the signal comes down the AV node, comes down the bundle of His, it can freely pass through the right bundle and rapidly depolarize the right side. But when it attempts to go down to the left, it gets blocked. And so what ends up happening is the left ventricle or the areas that the left bundle supplies are unable to get signal and the signal travels there from cell to cell gap junction, which is a very slow process as that signal from the right side in a delayed fashion has to travel all the way across the left ventricle. And so that is the cause of our widening of the widening QRS complex. Okay? So that's the first criteria. Is our QRS is going to be wide. And remember that the a wide QRS is greater than 120 milliseconds or 120 or excuse me or three small boxes. So that's first criteria. The next criteria is we need to understand what type of morphology is this going to create. So if I look at my EKG, if I choose a rhythm strip and I get an idea of what's going on, maybe I'll choose lead V5 down here, I'll notice that we've got a pretty regular rhythm if we look throughout. We've got a couple of early beats. We're not really going to focus on these early beats here just for the purpose of this lecture. This person happens to have a couple of premature atrial contractions. That's what they are. I'm not going to dive into it. What I notice is that when I zoom in though on those QRS complexes, they're wide. We have a wide complex rhythm. And this wide complex rhythm is occurring at a rate of roughly, say this QRS lands here, 300, 150, 175, somewhere between 75 and 100. I'm gonna call this 90 beats per minute. So we have a wide complex QRS. And I noticed that before all of my wide complex QRSs, I have these P waves, P waves. 
So it seems like there are P waves that are driving this rhythm. And so if I remember we evaluate our sinus P waves by looking for P waves that are upright in lead one and are upright in AVF, and that tells me that my P waves are going down to the left, and that's a sinus P wave. So remember, we have a sinus rhythm now with normal AV conduction, but it's conducting to a wide complex QRS. So that makes me think that maybe there's a bundle branch block like we talked about. So we know that you can have a right or a left bundle branch block. So now it's our job to determine is the wide complex QRS fitting a morphology that we should expect to see, morphologic changes that we should expect to see in a bundle branch block pattern. And so let's take a look at what's gonna happen here. So the first thing I want to talk about is if we start from the beginning. Remember, if the left bundle is blocked, like we're talking about here, now the left bundle is going to be blocked like so. There's my block. Now I want you to notice what happens. So the signal is going to come from the AV node. It's going to travel down to the right side like we talked about. And it's going to depolarize the right side really fast. So the initial aspect of the QRS is going to be nice and sharp. What ends up happening though is we get delayed signal that heads towards to the left side. So notice the direction of these forces. They're going lateral. So we're going to call this late forces heading laterally, right? So in the concept of time, remember time is our x-axis of our EKG, towards the end of the QRS, we should see an extra positive deflection, specifically in the leads that are lateral, because we're heading in that direction, right? These forces, these late forces are heading to the lateral aspect. What forces are going to be captured in a positive way? What leads are going to capture those forces positively? Leads one in AVL. And so what we'll see in leads one in AVL are these late positive forces that will end up being what we call kind of an R prime. So we should see some type of R prime. And so if I take a look here at these leads, lead one right here in blue, if I look, notice that after the onset of my QRS, my QRS should normally return back to the baseline. But look what I have here. It actually goes up, and then as it tries to return back, it actually gets this second positive R wave. And that right there is an R prime. So that is late positive forces heading towards lead one. And then we can also look at lead AVL here. And notice if I look at the QRS complex, you see I've got, it goes up, it's trying to come back down like it usually does, but then it gets this last R prime type of force that is indicative of late forces heading in that direction. So later on in the QRS, that's actually kind of what we would say is the cause of the widening of the QRS is that late slurry force as it's trying to head towards the left side. Now remember, our precordial leads, leads V1 through V6, if I look here, this is more of a transverse plane across our chest wall. Remember that the same thing is gonna happen, right? We're gonna have signal coming from the AV node, it's gonna pass nicely down the right bundle, right? And then it's gonna have to slowly cell to cell head to the left. Well, what are our lateral forces on the left? V5 and V6. So we should also expect late positive forces in V5 and V6, very similar to leads one in AVL. And if I look at V5 and V6, sometimes you can see that here. Notice we have our nice upstroke. We should expect for it to come down, but then we have another later R prime, just like that in V6. Up oh, there's the later one, that R prime. That tells me that there are late forces heading towards V5 and V6. So I'm starting to think, why would there be delayed forces towards the left side of the heart? It could be because the left bundle is blocked. And so rapid signal is not getting to the left ventricle. It's actually going to be delayed signal.
causing QRS widening and this R prime forces. So that's a really important wave to look for. It doesn't always have to be present in leads one, AVL, V5, and V6, right? Those are our lateral leads, but it should be present in at least two of them. That's usually the case. Now there's one more concept that I wanna to talk to you about with a left bundle branch block that I think is just fascinating. So in normal ventricular depolarization, we're gonna come up here. Actually, we're gonna come here. In normal ventricular depolarization, if I zoom in, I'm gonna to have to make my pin a little bit smaller. In normal ventricular depolarization, if I zoom in on my transverse leads, Notice that the interventricular septum, kind of highlighting in red, right? That's my interventricular septum. Notice that when signal initially, right, is going to come from the sinus node, sinus node is going to fire off, and that's going to generate our P wave, right? And that P wave is then captured here by my AV node, and it's sent down to the bundle of Hiss, my right bundle, and my left bundle. In normal ventricular depolarization, the left bundle, as the fibers are depolarizing, if you look really closely, notice these little fibers from the left bundle. As it's passing through the septum, which is the first part of the myocardium that's passing through, the left bundle is actually activating the septum. So the initial wave of depolarization within the ventricles is actually the interventricular septum, and it occurs from the left bundle from left to right. And so you'll get signals traveling from the left to the right across the septum. This is the initial wave of depolarization within the ventricles. And so that, if you notice the direction, is headed towards V1 and towards V2. In the beginning deflection of those QRS complexes have these little R waves that I'll highlight in red here. And these are our septal R waves, right? So that's just indicative of my V1, V2 capturing that septum depolarizing before the rest of the ventricles depolarize in a normal fashion, right? So imagine now that we've established that the septal R wave is created by left bundle transmission of signal to the septum, what happens in a left bundle branch block when the left bundle is blocked? Should we expect changes of our septal R wave? Well, of course. So right bundle or left bundle branch block, my left bundle is blocked. It's my left bundle being blocked. So when signal now comes from the AV node, it attempts to travel down the bundle of his into the left bundle, but it's blocked. It travels down here. So we get depolarization this way, but the septum does not depolarize in the normal fashion. The septum is actually captured as the signal is coming back across. So in a left bundle branch block, what I'm getting at is we also get the loss of what? The septal R wave. So we will no longer see that septal R wave. What we'll actually see is just a straight negative QRS complex where that septal R wave is no longer there. So look at V1 in this EKG, my QRS complex has no septal R wave. There is no septal R wave here. And that is how you can also determine the fact that this is a left spinal branch block. It's more evidence. And then there's one more thing I wanna to talk to you about generally with bundle branch blocks. It's that you see that after the QRS complex here, here's our QRS. Notice that the T wave and the ST segment are inverted, right? We have those inverted T waves, and it's kind of like that throughout the EKG, right? Anytime that there is a negative QRS, we have a positive T wave. Anytime that it's a positive QRS, we have a negative T wave. That's called ST slash T wave strain. And that strain pattern is because when we have aberrant conduction through the ventricles, you're also going to have aberrant repolarization. Remember that the T wave is representative of repolarization. So that's a little quick kind of look for that ST and T wave strain. It makes it really hard to evaluate for ST and T wave changes on an EKG. But yeah, so that's the idea here behind a left bundle branch block. And that's all the physiology behind it. Um, so what we need to do, every time you see a wide complex QRS, 
you need to determine is the atria driving the rhythm. We did that here. We said that there were sinus P waves driving this rhythm. And because now a sinus P wave is driving a wide complex rhythm, I look for bundle branch block morphology. And now we know how to determine a left bundle branch block. So I hope this helps. Tomorrow, uh, if you had to guess, we're going to do right bundle branch blocks. And I think it's going to be great. And we're going to be able to compare and contrast the difference, hopefully building on this physiology that we talked about. So I hope this helps. I hope you enjoy it. If you have any comments or questions, throw them down below. Uh, I'd love to help answer. Um, hope you're enjoying the challenge. See you on the next EKG video. Take care.